Join Kamal Karuju in exploring Sufism as both a spiritual dimension of Islam and as a way of life. Join us as we delve into spiritual practices of Sufis around the world. See how Sufi influence has touched Muslim art, music, science, and culture, and apply Sufi teachings as solutions to modern crisis. We are going to talk about Sufism, and then you may say, then what is this tasawwuf? Um, obviously, the word Sufism is in English, and uh, tasawwuf is the uh, Arabic version of it. Tasawwuf actually can be understood to be a little bit more than Sufism. Uh, it is the study of Sufism. It is the whole understanding of what Sufi lifestyle is like. And uh, we are going to get into that. Now, this is a three-week program. When I was first asked to do this class, my initial reaction was, oh my god, I have nothing to say. So how am I going to feel this? And then after I started building this uh, slide, I said, oh my god, how am I going to finish this? <laughs> uh, so you will find a lot of details. And uh, I hope that you will ask questions. I'm going to use this slide as my general uh, kind of main street that I'm going to try to stick with. Uh, but your uh, questions will hopefully guide me. And we may end up in some other places. Who knows? Not necessarily the topics that we are going to uh, see in this slide. Uh, slides are not very complicated. Usually, they are actually very short sentences because uh, I don't want you to get stuck in this slide. I want you to um, understand the concept. And um, you will find that some of the things I will tell you, they will feel like they are circular. It's like, didn't he explain that two weeks ago? Why is he talking about it again? Uh, because some of these subjects are so closely related with one another. And in order to understand one, you have to know the other one. And so how am I going to explain the first topic without you knowing the second topic? And then when we come to the second topic, then I, I may have to refer back to the first topic. So there will be some feelings of circular uh, explanation. So bear with me with that. Having said that, uh, we are going to talk about Sufism. And let's talk about this uh, picture. In the West, usually when you hear the word Sufi or Dervish, uh, the first thing that people think about is Rumi and whirling Dervishes. Uh, but they are not the only kind of Sufis. There are many, many different kinds of Sufis. Um, very wide spectrum. And their methodologies are very different from one another, another sometimes. And actually, between Sufi schools, sometimes there is this friendly competition. Uh, you know, they may think, OK, he's talking about love. What does he know about love? You know? My teacher says this. So you will see that uh, effect also, that there will be some competition with, between uh, Sufi schools. Allah, there is no deity except him, the ever-living, the sustainer of all existence. Neither drowsiness overtakes him nor sleep. To him belongs whatever is, whatever is in the heavens and whatever is on, on the earth. Who is it that can intercede with him except by his permission? He knows what is presently before them and what will be after them. And they encompass not a thing of his knowledge except for what he wills. His cursey extends over the heavens and the earth, and their preservation tires him not. And he is the most high, the most great. This is from the second chapter of Quran, verse 255. I started with this uh, because uh, in studying Sufism, you have to understand the place of Quran. What is the importance of Quran, the holy book of Muslims, in the life of a Sufi? If you miss that, you will be missing a huge chunk. And uh, I started with this because this particular verse is quite special. For example, when a Muslim is afraid, we recite this. 
when, for example, when there is a thunderstorm or I am afraid that my house might be uh, you know, destroyed by a, a, a tornado, I recite this. When my child is sick, I recite this. So this is a very special verse that uh, many Muslims, if not all, would memorize, actually. Sufism is not a separate religion. So I'm not describing you a religion that is uh, brand new. Uh, it is part of Islam. And you will see why that is the case. However, when you come to the West, especially today, uh, you will find some people who will say that they are Sufis and they will say they are not Muslim. So this is, um, at least as far as I know, this is relatively new uh, situation. Uh, normally, historically speaking, when you think about Sufis, you think about Muslims. When we talk about Sufism, we have to understand the background. What are the foundations of Sufism? Is this something that, you know, 1,500 years ago, somebody said, okay, let's come up with some new stuff, and they just made it up? You know, what is the, where is the root of this Sufism? Where does the practices of Sufism come from? And how do Muslims justify these practices? And you will see why that word is important, justify. Um, then we will see some examples uh, of what Sufis do. And uh, actually, to understand this, you have to have some background knowledge. Uh, I'm not going to go into Islam 101 uh, type of presentation. I will assume that either you know you know, five pillars of Islam, six articles of faith of Islam, which we can get into if you are interested, but I wanted to talk about other stuff. Uh, you know, those basics, 101, Islam 101 uh, knowledge is available in the internet or you can buy uh, many books that can teach you. So I'm not going to go into that. But I will try to explain some uh, basic concepts that are required for understanding Sufism. I put this slide, as I was building this, I said fact, truth, evidence, reason, knowledge. You know, these words are important in our culture in US, right? I mean, we base our existence. We use science and we use law and we trust the facts. We trust the truth. We seek the truth. We look for evidence. And we look for reasons, and we value knowledge and knowledgeable people. I left the reality by itself because those other things do not necessarily guarantee reality. And we can come up with many examples how we can have, we think we have facts, we think we have knowledge, we think we have reason, a reasoning mind, but we don't have the reality. So one requirement of understanding Sufism is perhaps uh, possibility, allowing possibilities to flourish. Uh, don't be stuck with frames. Look beyond what may appear as true or real, uh, because you may be surprised that what you think real or true may not be, depending on where you are looking at it. So we are going to get into those kinds of concepts. And I wanted to talk about for, since we are all studying physics in uh, school, uh, one of the best ways of explaining uh, where Sufism fits into Islam is comparing Newtonian uh, physics to quantum physics. OK, I, I don't want to lose you. <laughs> What I mean by this is, based on Newtonian physics, we can calculate, if I throw this telephone at this angle, at certain speed, I can calculate to a very accurate degree where it will land. If I throw it in the air, I can calculate how fast it will hit the ground, whether it will break or not break. I have certain levels of certainty. I can trust the laws that I know. But when we get into quantum mechanics, which talks about not the planets, you know, with the Newtonian uh, physics, we can talk about planets. I can calculate 
where moon and the sun and the earth will be thousand years from today. Easily. I can make tables. You know, there are people who do that. But with quantum mechanics, that means we are looking at the low level uh, existence. We are looking at the level of atom and electron and proton and even smaller than that. And if you ever studied quantum physics, you will know that there is no certainty. There is only probability in quantum physics. For example, here is an electron that is going around, you know, a, a helium um, atom. So the, the electron is going around it. So based on Newtonian physics, I should be able to calculate this electron will be at this spot at this time. If I know the current position, I know the speed, I know the path, right? It's just common sense. I should be able to calculate where this electron will be 10 minutes from today, from now, or 10 seconds from now. But we learned that through science, it is not possible. I can only say that there is a 50% chance that this electron will be at this location 10 minutes from now. I can only make a guess. So, but these two exist at the same time. They don't violate one another. I cannot just say, okay, one is true, other one is, you know, not true. One describes reality, other one is just dream world. No. These two concepts explain the reality of our universe, but at different levels. So how do they work together? And how am I supposed to now make sense of my life and my existence based on these two different explanations of universe? So when you think about Sufism, just keep this in mind. It's going to be handy. What is reasonable and what is fantastical? I think this is the right word, right? Fantastical. Um, some of the things I will share with you, you will say, yeah, sure. <laughs> you won't believe me. I know you won't. Because some of the stories you will hear, the people who are involved in them, they didn't believe it either. Why am I talking about reasonable and fantastical? Well, with modern science and modern education, our senses are trained. We are trained to come up with conclusions based on reason and evidence. The question here is, what is evidence? And what kind of reasoning are you using? So when you get into study of spirituality, reason takes a different shape. When you go into things like talking about God and existence and creation and my, my spirit, which is not possible to, you know, Proof by scientific methods that I have spirit. Now, how am I supposed to use some rules of science to explain this? Of course, what I say will sound fantastical. Wow, great, great story. And even this is true, even for many Muslims. Things, some of the things I will tell you, many Muslims will say, I don't believe that. Or I have never seen that, and I'm not sure about that. Because this is not necessarily just about religion. This is also about how you look at the universe, how you look at the world, how do you judge what is going on around you. You know, sometimes if you have friends, you know, I have some friends, they are very mathematical. You know, everything is reasoned and you can follow their logic. And I have some other friends who are artists. You know, they're artists, and artists are different kinds of people. <laughs> you know, their reasoning is different. So keep this in mind as well. I wanted to start, start with a fantastic story. Well, this story actually takes place at the time of Moses. And it is kind of strange. I was thinking about that today, that we have a lot of Moses stories in Sufism. I don't know why, but Moses appears many times, peace be upon him. He appears many times in Sufi stories. But this particular story is actually not in other books. It is in Quran. So God is telling us, Muslims, this story. Moses, peace be upon him, is a great prophet of God. One day he asks God, O Lord, 
Is there anybody who is more knowledgeable than me? And God says, go to such and such place. There's a place that you will know when you reach there. Your sign is that you will, you will lose the fish. And when you arrive there, you will know that you have arrived there. And then you will find the teacher there. Go be with that teacher. Let him teach you. So apparently there is somebody who is more knowledgeable than Moses. So Moses takes his servant, and they take some fish with them to eat, and they start traveling. And at some point, they stop, you know, they rest, and the servant takes the fish out and puts it on, on a rock. And they, they continue their travel. The servant forgets. And Moses says, it is time to eat. We are hungry. Let's prepare the fish. And the servant says, oh, I forgot. The Satan made me forget. And then they go back, and they realize, Moses realizes that this is the place where he is supposed to find his teacher. So he comes to the rock where they left the fish. Of course, fish is all gone. And he starts waiting, and he finds a man, or somebody who appears to be a man. His name is Khidr. Now, don't get stuck with the pronunciation. These are Arabic words, so spelling and pronunciation, just forget about it. In Arabic, it means green. So Khidr, he accepts Moses as a student, but he has some conditions. He says, you cannot handle being with me. Are you sure you want to do this? And Moses insists. He wants to go. And he says, I will take you with me under the condition that you will not ask me any questions. You will observe what I do. You will not ask any questions until I tell you what I do. But until that time, don't ask me anything. Moses accepts it, and they continue. So they come to a place. They are supposed to cross a body of water. They get into a ship. And as they are traveling with the ship, this man, who is the teacher of Moses, uses some instrument, probably, and damages the ship. So the ship starts you know, taking water. And Moses says, what have you done? This ship belongs to very poor people. They earn their livelihood by you know, crossing the river or the sea, taking people across. And you damage their ship. What have you done? And the teacher says, didn't I tell you you cannot handle what I do? And Moses says, I'm sorry. I forgot. I will not do this again. Please accept my uh, apology. So he accepts his apology, and they continue on their way. They come to a village. And in this village, there is a, uh, they are hungry by now. They need to eat something. So they ask, could you please give us some food? You know, nobody gives. This was not a very hospitable uh, village. Nobody wanted to give them any food. So Khidr, he sees a wall that is leaning down. It is about to collapse. And he goes and repairs the wall. And Moses, Moses says, what have you done? You could have asked for some payment for this. You know, we could have eaten. You, know, you repair the wall, that's fine. But we could have eaten something because of your work. And man says, didn't I tell you that you cannot handle what I do? And Moses again says, I am sorry. I will not do this again. If I do it one more time, then you can split with me. You don't have to, you know, I, I will leave you if you just give me one more chance. So they continue their travel. They come to a place, and Khidr, he finds a young boy and kills it. Kills the boy. And Moses cannot handle this. He says, you have done a wretched thing. What have you done? You took an innocent life. What is wrong with you? And the teacher says, didn't I tell you that you cannot handle what I do? So now it is time for us to split. I will tell you the reality of what you have seen. The first place that when we were in the ship and I damaged the ship, there was a king who was coming to that area. And it, he was confiscating all the ships that are in good condition. I damaged that ship so that he would not take the ship of these poor people. It would be damaged so they can keep their ship. And the place where I repaired the wall, I repaired it because that wall belongs to 
couple of orphans, and they are too young to take care of their property, and there is a treasure buried under that wall. If that wall to, be, you know, to topple, the treasure would come out, and people would just take it. They wouldn't be able to defend their treasure. We wanted them to have that treasure as they get older, so we repaired that wall. And the child that I killed, this child's parents are righteous people, and we were concerned that this child may mislead them. So we took this child, and God will give them another one who is better for them. Now, I know that this last part is not easy to handle. And this is where your understanding of universe, God, existence, where do I begin, where do I end, what happens to me when I die, all these things get into the conversation. One thing I can guarantee you is that conversations about Sufism is not always joyful. That you should be ready for some uncomfortable things too. Discomfort is not bad. Discomfort can make you grow. So how to understand this? So that you don't have, because my goal is not to reduce your love of God. My goal is to increase your love of God. So I'm going to tell you another story. Hopefully it will help you. One day this man comes to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, crying. He says that he has lost his child. This man had a, you know, maybe a toddler, a small child, a girl, that was killed in a river. So she, he was very upset. He comes to the prophet and says, I have lost my baby. And prophet has sorrow in his heart, holds the man's hand, and they go to the river. They find the body of the baby. And he prays to God. And the child is resurrected. Child comes to life. And he asks, oh child, wherever you are, are you comfortable there? Would you like to come back to your parents? And the child says, no, 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 I'm very comfortable. I don't want to come back. So the concept of life and death, the concept of suffering, what is suffering and what is not, uh, these are not easy questions. And like I said earlier, uh, don't be so quick to judge what is real and what is not real. These are some classical definitions of Sufism, since our topic is Sufism. And by the way, if you have any questions, don't feel shy. Many, going back to, you know, going back some of them, thousand years. Uh, by the way, the source of this is Dr. Ellen Godless, who is a professor of religion at UGA. He is a wonderful source uh, for uh, these types of uh, issues. So I got this from him. So these, uh, when asked about Sufism, Muhammad ibn Ali al-Qassab, the master of Junaid. Now you have to be ready for this kind of language because in Sufism, who is master, who is student, that lineage is very important. Said Sufism consists of noble behavior that is made manifest at, the noble at a noble time on the part of a noble person in the presence of a noble people. Okay, we need a dictionary to explain this one. What does this mean? Just keep in mind, keep an open mind. Junaid, the student says, Sufism is that you should be with God and without any attachment. You know, when I read this first time, I said, you know, my Buddhist friends would love this <laughs> explanation. <laughs> and uh, Ruwaim ibn Ahmed said, Sufism consists of abandoning oneself to God in accordance with what God wills. This is actually very close to the definition of what Islam is, surrendering yourself to God, giving up your will or preferring God's will to your own will. Okay, so that's what Sufism is. Uh, Samnun says, Sufism is that you should not possess anything, nor should anything possess you. Okay, this actually sounded very, um, something Jesus Christ would say, probably. 
Christ in Islam is also very much uh, respected, and you find many of his stories also in Sufism. He is used many times, peace be upon him. Abu Muhammad al-Jarrari said, Sufism consists of entering every exalted quality and leaving behind every dis uh, despicable quality. You know, these are very general things. And this last one, Sufism is that at, at each moment, the servant should be in accord with what is most, most appropriate at the moment. How can you get more generic than that? <laughs> I put a red uh, star there later on. The reason is, as I was preparing, I you know, wanted to watch something for entertainment. And I was listening to a British uh, um, film where a very proper British person was describing what a gentleman is. <laughs> and he described gentlemen. I don't know if we have some Brits uh, among us, so I don't know if they will agree with me. but. He said, a gentleman is somebody who is always polite and who does the right thing all the time. Now, I could add that here. So we should not be stuck with labels. Uh, Sufi, a gentleman, and I'm sure you can find nice person, nice guy, a neighbor, a good neighbor. And all these words describe, and sometimes we get stuck with the label, and we forget about the meaning behind it. And this is my definition. Not a definition, actually, my laundry list. To be a Sufi means to seek, to know, to love, to desire to be loved by, to forsake all others for, to obey, to do the work of, to ask help only from, to please and to be pleased with, to be in presence of, to lose yourself in the one who is known by the most beautiful names. Uh, this last part is actually most beautiful names. You will see in a second that in Islam it is called Asma'ul Husna. The most beautiful names belong to God. So whatever beautiful name you can think of. Uh, Hadith Qudsi, what is, what is that? It's, it's not a name of a person. The word Hadith or Hadith means a saying of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. 